This is session 10 for Models in Epidemiology and Biostatistics. I'm Gordon Hilton Fick. The first nine sessions in this series were exclusively devoted to outcomes that were dichotomous. Success, failure. Disease, no disease. Remission, no remission. And we will be revisiting dichotomous outcomes in later sessions, uh, but it is time to uh, consolidate some of the issues that have been alluded to in some of the previous sessions and provide some of the details. And uh, in sessions 11 and 12, we'll be looking at ordinal outcomes, and we'll be looking at uh, outcomes that are counts. And so we'll be taking a, uh, a look at circumstances in which the left-hand side of the regression equation is other than the log of the odds. Later on in, uh, in this session, we will also revisit uh, if only briefly, other ways to model dichotomous outcomes other than with um, logistic or the logit link, as they, as they say. But now on to the content for session 10. There are several topics, and they're, they're somewhat disconnected, but that's okay. That's what, that's what, well... Thank you for bearing with me. In any case, uh, the next issue we're going to look up is uh, to do with a circumstance in which uh, the software you're using give, gives you a rather intimidating diagnostic and, uh, and then takes certain actions. And what we want to do is look at the background behind that and then uh, look at uh, some of the challenges that the uh, the analyst faces when uh, when when dealing with issues like this. So, a little bit of a reminder. Then, the right hand side of our equation so far has been a linear combination of columns of data, where the weights are these. Uh, regression coefficients, the usually given with Greek letter betas. And then the columns are the explanatory variables that we are interested in using for the purposes of these models. Now, any of you who've uh, opened up the, uh, the, the data screen in Stata or other, other sources will recognize that we are sealing columns of, of data. And this may well a, a trigger memories from your past, or maybe present, of these things being thought of as vectors. And uh, then you may well also be thinking, oh man, I, I thought about a lot of this uh, some time ago when I took uh, perhaps even a course in linear algebra. So we're going to be dealing with uh, a, a situation in which we want to be uh, presenting the models we use in such a way that they are not a linearly dependent set of vectors. Okay, let's take a, a brief example that may, may help you as you begin to navigate this issue. Let's suppose we are planning on using age groups and that for this illustration, which we haven't actually done so far, we'll suppose there's three levels. We'll suppose that all of the participants in the study have their ages grouped into young, middle-aged, and old. And we'll suppose that the codes for that would be one, two, three. And then we have indicators for those which we'll call A1, A2, and A3. 
Now, we will suppose that we've been we've done this correctly and every participant is in exactly one of these three groups. There's, they're not they don't appear in, in more than one group and everybody's in exactly one group. Okay. So the indicators then, which we could write out, if if uh, AI is a is a one if the participant is in group I and is zero otherwise. Well, then we can notice that the sum of those three I three three A's, A1 plus A2 plus A3 is one. Because, well, everybody's a one everybody gets gets to be a one exactly once in exactly one group. Okay, let's say a sum of the AAs is equal to one. Okay. Let's think about the implications of that. If, if I may. Let's just think about a particular participant in your study. If we were to know that A1 was 0 and A2 was 0, then we know that A3 must be 1. In other words, if we, we know that a participant is not young and is not middle-aged, then we know they are old. Again, this is using the notion of mutually exclusive and exhaustive sets. Each participant is described by an age group, by age group, in one and only one of them. Okay. So what does that mean? It means that the four columns are said to be linearly dependent because a one plus a two plus a three is equal to one. Okay. But as I mentioned, that is saying, it's saying that knowing any two of them determines the value of the third. Okay? It, it, and not just sort of, exactly. Okay. Well, again, you may recall this from your, your background in, uh, in uh, linear algebra. Yeah, there is a technical definition. If we have collection of vectors, which we'll call a1, a2, 3, up to ap. We say they form a linearly dependent set if there are constants, scalars, not all zero, so that that weighted sum of the a's is zero. Okay. And if there are no such ci's, then we say these vectors are linearly independent. Okay, let's take a look at our example from just above. In our example, P is 3, A0 is 1. So we can pick the C's, C0 minus 1 and C1, 2, and 3 equal to 1, in which case this gives us that the sum of the AIs is 1. All right, that means there are non-zero CIs Okay, and so that means that 1, A1, A2, A3 are linearly dependent. Okay. Now, it is also true that if we exclude any one of those three, of those four, then we, the remaining three form a linearly independent set. A little bit more technical, but for the moment at least. Let's suppose that such a step makes sense once we interpret the coefficients that result. Right? And we've done this before. In other words, if we were to remove any one of those four things, the remaining three form a linearly independent set. And let's revisit that context. And let's do so with a, a simple situation. Let's, let's start with um, a model that, as you will know, is not the model we would typically start with, with an actual logistic regression analysis, but no matter. Let's, let's choose this one as our start. Let's suppose that we have that the log of the odds of disease is beta naught plus beta 1e plus beta 2a2 plus beta 3a3. Now, you will notice, straight off, I have left off a1. A1's not there. Okay. What are the implications? 
Let's look. Let's suppose we contemplate and interpret this logistic regression equation in terms of the six possible circumstances. You'll recall here that if we have uh, age group, a one, a, a, sorry, age group, young, middle-aged, and old, then there are three two-by-two two tables. That means in total there are six probabilities that we could study. Okay, now this model has just four of them. Now what's going on with that? Let's remember. Right. For the, let's, let's look at that equation now. Now I'll, I'll use my pointer here, this equation here. And let's interpret it and see whether or not it's of any value to us, okay? So in particular, we could write out what that equation says if you are a young person. If you're a young person, A1 is 1 and A2 and A3 are 0. That means for the young, we have that the log of the odds of disease is beta naught plus beta 1e. Okay, well then you will will recognize that for the young, beta 1 is the log of the odds ratio. Right, beta 1 is the log of the odds ratio for the young. All right, now let's look at the middle-aged people. That means that a 2 is 1, a 1 is 0, and a 3 is 0. All right, that means the equation is now the log of the odds of disease is beta naught plus beta 2 plus beta 1e. All right, a little bit of reflection. That means that beta 1 is the log of the odds ratio for the middle-aged people. Okay, oh, now you see where we're going. Now let's do it for the old people. Then a 3 is 1, a 2 is 0, and a 1 is 0. That means that equation specializes to beta naught plus beta 3 plus beta 1e. What does that mean? It means that beta 1 is the log of the odds ratio for the old people. Aha! Uh -huh. now, now we can recognize this particular equation is showing us that beta 1 is the assumed common log odds ratio, common to the young, the middle-aged, and the old. Assumed common, right. Let's try beta 2. All right. Now let's take those equations we had and, and, and write now that beta 2 can be seen as, the, as a difference. Right. Beta 2 is the difference between the young, I guess we would say, doing it in, in the right order, we would say the middle-aged and the young. It's the difference between the log of the odds of disease for the middle-aged and the log of the odds of disease for the young assume common to exposure. Okay. In other words, beta 2 is that difference it applies to those who are exposed, and it applies to those who are not exposed. Again, assume common. Beta 2 is the assume common difference between the log of the odds of disease for the middle-aged and the log of the odds of disease for the young. And we mean by assume common here, it's common to both the exposed and the unexposed. And beta 3, sure, let's take a minute and do it. We can see now that it is, again, if you're, if you're finding this a little bit daunting, write down the equation and specialize it to the, to the six different possibilities. That's the, way, that's the way to do it. In any case, we see that it's the difference between the log odds of disease for those who are old minus the log of the odds of disease for those who are young, assumed common to exposure. In other words, it's the same difference for those exposed as it is for those unexposed. Right. In other words, we've now, we've now recognized that this is, in fact, an example of an additive model. Right. Now let's take a look at a circumstance in which we
include beta 4 here, and now I'm going to take a look at this equation here, right? Beta 4 times a1. In other words, the same equation, and do we get anything of any value if we did so? Well, the first thing that, that I will note for you is that if you use data and try to fit this, you'll get, you'll get a diagnostic from the software, and one of the, uh, the A's will be deleted from the equation list before it's fit. And usually, most software, it deletes the last one in the list. But there's nothing special here about that last one. However, let's take a look at what the implications would be if we had not removed A1. Okay? Then what we can see, using the fact that, the, that A1 plus A2 plus A3 equals 1, which we saw above, it means that A1 is in fact 1 minus A2 minus A3. In other words, that equation which looks like it involves uh, five explanatory variables, in fact involves only four. Because we, if you then take that equation and re-express A1 in terms of A2 and A3, you see that you have merely taken one equation that it appears to involve five variables, but in fact, it involves only four. And that's an example of a linearly dependent set. And then we could say, oh, we've made a mistake. We've made an error. Now, the software is, is protecting us. It's giving us a diagnostic, and it's taking an action. But you, as the investigator, you need to decide which variable you wish to have as baseline. In this particular instance, the exclusion of A1 enables the regression coefficients to be interpreted as differences relative to the baseline group. Okay? It's, not that it, it's not that the young people are missing from the model. It, that's not true. Right? So you have to spend a bit of time kind of getting your head around this. It's, it's not as straightforward as one might like. Now, it turns out that this example I've shown you here might be the simplest example which isn't immediately obvious. If we had only two groups, then it would become, in other words, if we just had young and old, then it would have been more obvious that including both the indicator for A1 and A2, say, is merely in including uh, the indicator for the young and the indicator for the old, and, and we can see that again that, that the sum of the two is one. The same uh, issue comes up, frankly, with exposure. If we had included, instead of just the indicator for exposure, but we had included the indicator for the absence of exposure in that model, we get the same error message. You can't include them both. You have, to, you have to choose one. In a way, we're doing the same thing with exposure here. We're choosing baseline. Baseline being those who are not exposed. And you may want to take some time to reflect on all of this. The bottom line is model construction requires care and consideration. It is true that you get protected in some situations like this. When you go to try to fit the model, and then get a, essentially an error message. But it's, in a way, it's, it's almost better if you can anticipate things and get your logic right, right from the start. On the other hand, it happens all the time. I see, I, I've, I see many examples of, of this where investigators are concerned, they've, they, they, they know they've got a problem and they're not sure what's going on. Again, the software merely excludes the last number or the last vector that ensures you have a linearly independent set. But that might not be the one you want to choose. Okay. Now, we will come up against this issue of linear dependency in, a, in, a, in other ways later on in future sessions. And it can be much harder
to see in more complicated contexts that we'll be investigating later. One has to deal with the issue of so-called identifiability, and this refers to our regression coefficients, or more generally the parameters in a study. The regression coefficients need to be identifiable. And again, this issue, the, the notion of identifiability, and in, in this instance, uh, linear dependency and independ linear, in, linear independence are, are closely related, but they, they're not quite the same. And again, we will we'll revisit the whole, whole issue of identifiability in a, in, a, in a future session. So you may find it helpful to, to make things a little more elaborate here. And I will only just briefly set this up for you. But um, so let's make this, this problem a little more elaborate. But then you will, you will also, I hope, quickly identify that not, it's, it's a little more elaborate, but it is, in fact, the place where we would typically start such an analysis if we wish to model the log of the odds of disease as a function of exposure and age group, where we have the three age groups, right? And so if you did so with, say, say what we'll call here now model one, notice that if you interpret these equations, and I would encourage you to do so by specializing this equation to the six different uh, circumstances. Remember, there are three two-by-two two tables and six probabilities. That, in fact, determines these six regression coefficients, these six betas. Okay? And you can do so. This is very similar to what, what has been done in other sessions, so I'm not going to repeat this here, except to point out that all of the regression coefficients we get with model one here differ from the model that we had earlier. This is the model that enables the study of modification, whether or not age modifies. Whereas the previous model assumes there is no modification, right? The notion of assumed common. Now, why am I presenting this to you? Well, Model 1 might be the way in which we would, we would want to begin because that gives us the ability to study the log odds ratios. The log odds ratios for the young, for the middle-aged, and for the old. Okay? Now, in fact, we could have fit what turns out to be the same model, but by including, in this case, A1. Notice A1 is missing here, and A1 is baseline. And again, I would encourage you to revisit that. By the way, you may find it instructive to rewrite that model when the middle-aged are the baseline group, or the old are the baseline group. Uh, a couple of points there. The, those, those models, choosing the baseline, does not change the fitted values. It changes the interpretation of the regression coefficients. Oh, yeah. No, but there's another circumstance where there is no baseline group at all. In other words, it is merely these six regress these six uh, terms and no constant, no beta naught. This turns out to be a successful way of presenting the model as well. And in fact, the regression coefficients can be interpreted directly as being specific to the, uh, the three age groups. In other words, the model that has beta 1 A1 plus beta 4 E A1, it, it, this would be that sum of those two pieces involve the, the, the part of that equation that survives for the young. Because an A1 is 1, and A2 and A3 are both 0. Again, I would encourage you to explore this. Because there are instances in which we wish to fit models that do not have a constant. Okay? And in Stata, it's, it's, it's very, very easy 
So you include your outcome, the, in this case, the six explanatory variables, and then the option is no constant. This gives us exactly the same fit as models one and two. Okay, model, model one, sorry, model one gives the same fit as model two, okay? The regression coefficients change in their interpretation. Now, if you wish to study, for example, a log odds ratio for the middle-aged minus the log odds ratio for the young, then you can do so by using this command in Stata for linear combinations of the regression coefficients. There's a bit of, this is a bit of technical stuff. Most of the time, as I've said, this presentation of the model would be preferred where you select the baseline. On the other hand, this presentation is completely symmetrical in the, in, in the sense that there is no baseline specification. And then you can choose which regression coefficients combinations you wish to study. Uh, it's a, it's, you could say it sounds like a comparatively minor point. But notice that I have to be careful here. If I was to include these six terms and the constant, then a term gets deleted. In other words, this set of coefficients forms, this set uh, of these six terms is the basis of a linearly independent set, and so is this set of six. You can't have seven. Seven, there are only six possible here in this instance. Recall, six is the number of probabilities. It's the number of log odds that are possible. There are only six. Can't have more. Okay. So just in, uh, in summary then, Remember that most of the time, you're going to be the one, when you're using uh, indicators for a particular characteristic, and you're the one that is going to want to choose the baseline group. So that then the coefficients are interpreted as differences relative to that baseline. Okay. But there is always this option of not having a baseline. Again, I would encourage you when you're when you're trying this out with your own project to ch double check using the predict subcommand, the post estimation command, to check that the fitted values from each of the alternatives that you're understanding are in, are in play here are giving us are the same. The fitted values are the same. Okay, so that was a a a brief summary of the of some of the key issues when one is dealing with linear independence or somewhat in, in a negative sense the, the challenge of dealing with linearly dependent sets and what to do now in health research there are a wide range of circumstances in which the uh, columns are technically linearly independent. However, they're close to being a linearly dependent set. And in some instances, the software will in fact give a diagnostic, even though technically speaking, the, the, these columns are linearly independent but that there are issues that cannot be ignored. Okay. Maybe even worse is sometimes one's dealing with, with data sets where there are subsets that are nearly linearly dependent, but the software gives no clue, no warning, no diagnostic. In a way, that's even more serious. If you get a diagnostic, from your software, it means you've got some work to do. Okay, it means you've got to do some thinking. Have I got a sensible model? Do I need to review the logic? Is there a something hidden that I've missed that I need to give more careful consideration to? Okay. So let's take a an example. It's an old one, uh, and in fact, in in a way, doesn't really fit in 2022. 
but I think it will it will suffice, and I think you'll you'll understand why, in fact, the the circumstances are a bit dated. Nevertheless, let's suppose we're studying a, an eye disease in diabetics called retinopathy. And I was involved with a, a project uh, dealing with diabetic retinopathy some years ago. A very important, actually, a cohort study that was conducted here in the province of Alberta. Okay. Now let's suppose we have a person's age. It's been recorded. And we, for our discussions here, we'll suppose it's, it's an actual age that's been recorded. And further, we have also recorded how long the participant, the diabetic in the study, has had diabetes. Again, we'll suppose that's an actual measurement and it's done so in years. Further, we'll, we will suppose that they have uh, classified the individuals into either a type 1 diabetic or a type 2 diabetic. Now, this is where the issue of type 1 and type 2 becomes a little bit old. Now, there's, there's vastly more to the study of type 1 and type 2, but we'll leave that aside for the time being here. Okay. Let's suppose then that we have an indicator then, the indicator for type 1 or, and type 2. So the indicator here, type 2 equals 1, and type 1 will be coded or in, uh, using the indicator 0. Okay. And let's suppose we decide to consider a model of the form I'm, I'm displaying here. So here we're modeling where we're trying to understand the log of the odds of diabetic retinopathy as a function of a person's age, how long they've had, how long they've had diabetes, and the type. All right. Now here is the circumstance that we we are dealing with here. We if we were to fit such a model, let's look at two con two circumstances. Let's suppose we consider t equals 0. Okay. If T is 0, that means they are type 1. And in the past, type 1 diabetics were those that were diagnosed near, near birth. I mean, we, the knowledge that a person was uh, a diabetic of the type 1 classification often came early. Well, what would that mean? It would mean that A and D are typically nearly the same. They differ by a small, a small amount. Because type 1 diabetics, at least in the past, going using that, this history here, were diagnosed at a young age. Okay. So that D would be just a little less than A. On the other hand, if a person is coded T equals 1, then they are a type 2. It, it used to be that type 2 diabetes was not seen in the young and would only appear at later life. In other words, that A and D here are typically quite different. Okay. In fact, it is typically the case that if one is a type 2 diabetic, that A and D are rarely close. Now that, again, I'm, I'm, I'm using old news here. No matter. Now notice the knowledge of T and A for a participant tells us a lot about D. In other words, for example, if we knew a person's uh, a classification of T was a, was a zero and we knew their age, then we'd know their, 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 the length of time they've had diabetes is close to their age, just a little less than their age, perhaps. In other words, knowing two of these variables tells us a lot about the third. Okay, not exactly, but we're narrowing it down, right? On the other hand, if if T is uh, 1 and A, and we know A, then we know that the D and A are not the same, okay? So, so again, knowledge of T and A tells us a lot about D. Okay, now this kind of notion has come to be called multicollinearity. That A, D, and T are of this type. 
where it, knowledge of any two at least partially determines the third. I'm not exactly sure where this term, terminology of multicollinearity uh, got started, but it's, uh, it's been around and it's wi in wide use. Okay, may actually go back to the very early days of, of computing with a software system called SPSS. In any case, so here we have a circumstance in which, well, what, what's going to happen? If we leave A, D, and T in, uh, in this model, even with this concern about knowledge of two partially determines the third, well, we can have trouble. It turns out that in some circumstances, the standard errors for the estimates of the regression coefficients can be quite large. And coefficients can be in the wrong direction, okay? We could, we could get an odd, an odd circumstance in which we get that uh, the estimate of the coefficient for age is negative, which we would, would see as, oh, oh, oh. Does that gonna, is that going to make any sense? Does, can the log of the odds of, of diabetic retinopathy decline with age? Okay, we, so we might get cues, large standard errors, coefficients that are not in the right direction. Okay, in other words, it might be that we have a scenario that is essentially unrealistic. It may be uh, uh, not, not possible to contemplate a set of individuals with, with T and A, say, uh, known, known for it to be some value, and then to explore the range of possible values for D. Maybe the knowledge of, of T and A dramatically restricts the range of possible values for D. Okay. And there are many circumstances here. So multicollinearity will often appear and it is a complicated subject, and one for which, again, the, an, the analyst may be obliged to consider alternatives in, th in the presentation of the model. This is a large topic, and one for which I've really only scratched the surface for you. But I guess my, 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 my key point for you will be that if when you fit a model you get Un unrealistically large standard errors or coefficients in that, appear to, that appear to be in the wrong direction, or if you get a diagnosis, I mean, if you get a diagnostic, excuse me, that is uh, saying a variable has been excluded, it means that it's time for some, from tough, some tough thinking, some tough stuff. Let's now address the quite important issue in model construction, and that is centering. And we're going to uh, try to fill in some of the details in, uh, in this session that have, been, that have been seen rather briefly in other, in other earlier sessions. One of the rationales for centering of an explanatory variable that's measured is to enable quality interpretations for the regression coefficients that are not available when centering. For example, a regression coefficient may be interpreted relative to a value of A is zero or age of zero, even though no one was, was age zero in the study. Rather, centering relative to some value that is in the study then gives the regression coefficient an interpretation relative to that, that the age we centered on. Okay. On the other hand, there are certain instances in which centering gets us into trouble. And so I'd like to take a, a circumstance here. Let's suppose we have the very simplest, I, I guess, regression of, it could be a logistic regression, or or it could be one of a whole range of other regression models in which we get a fit that is equal to just a constant times a measured explanatory variable x. 
No constant term there, okay? Just y is equal to bx. That it, that is, in fact, the fitted values there form a line with slope b, um, but a line that goes through, through 0, 0. Now let's suppose that we take that same model and instead of using the measured variable x, we use a centered version of it, say x minus c. Then one gets a different fit with, with slope, what I'll call b prime here. And a line that goes through c0 now, not the origin, and with slope b prime. It turns out that all of the fitted values for these two models will be different, except where the two lines meet. And here's a, a visual to help you to appreciate this. The two lines y equals 3x and y equals 6 times x minus 1. Okay, the first line must go through 0, 0, 0, and the second line must go through 1, 0. Oh, but they only have that one common fitted value. Okay. So notice that if for whatever reason I was considering a model just say log of odds of disease equals beta, beta 1 times x, that I cannot center x. Okay. Without completely changing the interpretation. Okay, the fitted values will be different. On the other hand, if we have a model that includes the constant and includes the variable that's measured, x, then the fit will look like b0 plus b1, b0 plus b1x. Now consider the same model that we were considering with 1 and x, but now with x centered as x minus c. Now the fit, again with a, just a little bit of rearrangements of the equation, would look like b0 plus b1c plus b1 all times x minus c. Now if you think about that, that's the same line. It's exactly the same line. Both versions of this line give us the same equation. So it means that if we are fitting, say, a logistic regression equation, like log of odds of disease equals beta naught plus beta 1x, where x is measured, that centering is okay. And that is because we have included the constant. If we don't include the constant, then the fitted values are not the same. Okay. Let's look at some other circumstances here that may help you to appreciate what's going on. Let's consider a model that may include many variables, okay? So we've, we've got a candidate model with many pieces to it. But now we're, we're concerned about the inclusion of a variable that's measured, um, which we'll again label x. But there aren't any other terms involved, okay? And... Uh, we're wondering what, what, what this model will look like if we center x. Well, then beta x must be replaced by bc times 1 plus beta times x minus c. In other words, if x is to be replaced with x minus c, then one must have the constant term in the model. And that's not just for the simple model that I showed you first. We could have an elaborate model that has many other terms in it, but if those terms don't involve x as either, say, a quadratic or perhaps other, other terms like interaction terms and so on, then the inclusion of x must include the constant. Okay. That's, that's not maybe, that's must. If we're going to center x, we must include the constant, no matter how elaborate the model is. You might be thinking, yeah, most of the time I include the constant, yeah, right, right, right. But it gets a bit trickier. Let's suppose we're considering 
models that include two variables, say x1 and x2, and we wish, we wish to center x1, but we're not going to be centering x2, and I'll come back to why we would not center a particular variable in a minute. Or maybe, I, maybe I'll mention it now. If, if in particular x2 is an indicator variable, you don't center ind indicator variables. That's meaningless. But centering of a measured, exp measured explanatory variable can have interpretation. Okay. <laughs> so what about we have a model that, that we plan on including x1 and x2. We, we, we consider the possibility of centering x1, but not centering x2. Now, let's suppose for, for some reason we wish to include the, the term that is the product of x1 and x2. For example, we may wish to be, uh, we may wish to be exploring some interaction. We may wish to be exploring some modification. Many issues in play. Well, if we're going to center x1, then the term x, uh, uh, sorry, beta x1, x2 must be replaced by the term that involves x2. In other words, if I'm going to ensure that the fitted values do not change when I center, when, I've in, when I'm including the product of x1 and x2, it means I must include x2. In other words, if x1 is to be replaced with x1 minus c1, then we must have x2 in the model in order to ensure the fitted values are, and here we'll use the lingo, invariant to the centering. Okay. Now you can notice here though that at least this particular part of the discussion does not partic does not specifically require that either one or x1 must be included in the model. It is x2 that must be included in the model. Okay. All right. Let's look at a couple more somewhat abstract circumstances, and then I'll, I'll come to a, shall we say, somewhat more practical example for you that may, that may assist you in understanding this. Let's suppose that both x1 and x2 could involve centering. Both of them are measured. We may wish to include uh, them both, and we wish to include the product of the two terms. Well then, if you think about centering both x1 and x2, you can see that in order to ensure that the centering doesn't change the fitted values, I must include the, the constant, I must include 1, I must include x1, and I must include x2. In a way, that's somewhat like what I just said in, in, uh, in example B, but now notice that it must, in, that even though we're discussing the inclusion of that product term, it necessarily implies we must have the other, the other terms, 1, x1, and x2. Now, the literature is filled with some of this type of circumstance. Uh, this principle has many names that are, that are seen in textbooks and in other places. The issue is about centering, though. I hope you, I can uh, instill that in you. Now, again, in this literature, just be, just be, be careful. So again, going back to this example. <clears throat> If both x1 and x2 are possibly being considered for centering, then it means we must include, if we're going to include the product of x1 and x2, we must include 1, x1, and x2. Now this, you'll see in some books and in some literature, they then refer to the model as being well-formed if that principle is followed. You'll also see the term hierarchically well-formulated. There's also a related but not quite the same principle that's, that's often cited in the construction of analysis of variance tables, another big topic we're not going to go into here. But the point to be made here is that the rationale for being well-formed or hierarchically well-formulated 
is actually based on whether or not the variables involved could be centered. Okay. One more example for you here then. We'll suppose that x1 is to be centered or could be centered and that x2 and x3 are not to be centered possibly because they're inter indicator variables. But as, uh, as we're going to see in a minute, there's other circumstances in which we wouldn't center, even though an explanatory variable is measured. Okay? Let's suppose we do, do though, want to consider a model that includes the product of three. And we've seen many in the previous nine sessions, well, the previous sessions concerning model construction, that the, pr the product of three terms isn't out of the question. It can be needed in, in certain highly realistic and practical circumstances. Nevertheless, it means that if we do contemplate or it makes sense for x to be x1 to be centered, then you consider what it, what the implication of centering that product of three terms involves. If that's the case, then in this instance we must include the product of x x2 and x3. Okay, so if x1 can be centered with x1 minus c1, then it means we must have the product of x2 and x3 in the model. This is somewhat counterintuitive, I guess, but in any case, that's the rationale. And the fact that that product of the three must be replaced by the product of the three plus the product of, of x, x, to, x2 and x3. And that's just the, the algebra, okay? Well, I think it, this is probably becoming a, a seemingly a little bit technical and a little bit abstract. I wanted to uh, pass along uh, an example now of a model that we have seen many times in this uh, in these in these sessions. That's where we have uh, an, an exposure, we have age, and we have gender. Now. We could ask, if I wish to include that product of G A of the three terms, G, A, E, then, as I mentioned above, it means we must include G, E. Okay? That is the specialization uh, of the requirement from Part D. Okay? So if we're going to include the product of G, of G and A and E, I must include G, E. Okay, because A is, as I've set this up, is measured and exposure and gender are dichotomous. Okay, that's as, I, as I've set this up for you here. Okay, so it means that in order for the fitted values to, to have invariance of the fitted values, if I wish to include a model that includes all three, I must include GE. Now you could say, well, what if I if I wish if I, we are to include G A, we must include G, and if we are to include A E, we must include E, and so on. Okay. On the other hand, let's go back and consider a circumstance, and this comes from an actual an actual project. I I'll anonymize it here, but an actual project in which we did wish to contemplate the assumption that for the unexposed in this project, the log odds of disease relationship with age does not depend on gender. Well, it turns out that then suggests the exclusion, exclusion of GA. Okay? Now you might say, is that going to, if I exclude GA, am I going to lead, um, is that going to lead to a model that when I center H will give me different fitted values. Well, almost always in circumstances like this, it's advised that you contemplate the centering of H and look at what the implications are. And if you do so, if you do so, then what happens? Okay. It means the coefficients for the constant and for E and GE are now specific to that centered 
value of age. But notice here that the fitted values will not change from the fitted values from the model with age uncentered. In fact, we can express that last version, this with the centering involved, in terms of the uncentered age. And sure enough, we get that the coefficients for 1, E, and G are now specific to age equals 0, but the centering has not changed the fitted values. Okay. Now, it is, so it's worth noticing here that the inclusion or exclusion of GA in the model um, it need not be based on the age centering issue. In other words, such a model with GA excluded is, is a perfectly fine model insofar as with, if, if gender and exposure are dichotomous and we won't be centering them, and age is measured and could be centered, then in fact uh, the exclusion of GA is perfectly fine. Okay. Now, it did, it did turn out, in this particular instance, that, that, the, that analyzing this data with the assumption of GA being excluded, the regression coefficient for GA, being, that being beta 3, being 0, did lead to a stronger uh, identification of a disease exposure relationship in this, in this instance. Now, that identification was very much dependent on the quality of the assumption that it was made. And that was that beta 3 was 0. So again, just to remind you here, this is an instance in which we're not beginning with this term beta 7 per se in our investigation of this, of this model. In fact, our first step was a decision to assess whether beta 3 was 0 and whether that was a good place to go, and whether there was any rationale for it, perhaps from the existing literature. Okay, there are uh, some other examples that uh, involve uh, the inclusion and exclusion of terms in a model, and I think I'm going to uh, um, leave them on, on the display here. There's many different circumstances that investigators can face when one is dealing with a circumstance in which a variable could be centered and certain other terms are contemplated for the model. And as I say, I've given you E, F, G, and, and, uh, and, then, and then point out that, in fact, there are many other circumstances. So you could pause the, uh, the video, I guess, here and, 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 and review this for yourself. Now, now we want to go to a circumstance that is very closely related to the centering issue I've just discussed. And that is a circumstance in which the explanatory variable is in principle measured, perhaps with an assumption of linearity. Nevertheless, we would not want to center. And that's what's coming up next. So now I'd like to just take just a, just a few minutes and discuss a circumstance in which we would not want to center a measured explanatory variable. Entire textbooks have been written and monographs have been written on this issue. Um, perhaps the, the, the finest and certainly perhaps the most well known was a book written by David Finney some years ago, Statistical Methods in Biological Assay. Um, again, a, a, a large issue, important, and occurs in health research as well, in, in circumstances that pop up in, in surprising circumstances, not just in the analysis of assays. However, what I'm going to do here is formulate it in, in terms of an assay, and I, th I think that the circumstances will be fairly, fairly easy, I think. But it will be, again, bringing up an instance in which centering is not available. So let's suppose we have, we have two drugs. 
a standard version and a test version. So we'll let the variable e be uh, 0 for, for standard and e equals 1 for test. Okay, and both versions of these drugs are being tested at very low dosage, dosages and possibly even including the zero dose or the placebo perhaps or the absence of the drug. In such a scenario, a starting point for the analysis might involve an assumption of linearity at these low doses. So we have the log of the odds of some outcome being uh, this familiar combination of those four terms. Now you might be thinking, okay, um, where do I start here? Well, this is another instance in which we would not start with beta 3. In fact, most, most often one begins with the assessment of beta 1, either from the point of view of a statistical test or by a consideration of the assumption implicit in, uh, in such uh, an, uh, in, in, uh, an, sorry, the <laughs> an, an implicit assumption here that we might win, wish to make. So there's some discussion about whether a test should be made or whether it, it, whether or not it should just be assumed. And here the circumstance is whether or not beta one should be assumed to be zero. Hmm. What does that mean? Huh. In this instance, with uh, two, two drugs at low dosages, this, this particular test is sometimes called a validity test. Now what's going on here? Because what we're seeing then is that at zero dose of the standard drug, we would want to have z that the outcome is the same as zero dose of the test drug. Okay. In other words, if the validity test is not significant, or if it is known that beta 1 must be zero, then we are essentially implicitly assuming that the two lines emanate from the same point B0. Okay. That is the same thing as saying that zero dose of the test drug is the same as a zero dose of the standard drug. And you might say, well, that's always going to be the case. But keep in mind that if we're dealing with explanatory variables that are some distance away from zero, then that, and in fact zero might not even be contemplated, that the assumption of linearity at that distant value might not be tenable and might not be realistic. Okay. So now we're considering a model that looks like this. Now notice that such a model is not allowing centering. Okay. Because the inclusion of ED is not requiring in this instance, that beta 1 must be included. Okay. In other words, even though dosage might be, might be perceived as measured, and here using the assumption of linearity, uh, we would not center because the zero dose is so crucial to the issue. It's fundamental to the interpretation. It is not all uh, not that uh, then unrealistic to see that centering would change very dramatically change what we're trying to do here, and would centering in this instance would lead us to, frankly, probably a nonsense situation. Whereas it's far more practical or realistic in this instance to suppose that a zero dose of the standard drug is the same as a zero dose of the test drug and we're dealing with a linearity assumption that extends down to that zero dose. All right, let's look at this model now again. And this then becomes the basis for our interpretation. We then get two models, if I may, one for the test and one for the standard. And this quantity k is interesting because it, it becomes then the 
the prob probably the crucial part of this assay, and that is it is the so-called relative potency. K here is 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 giving us the quantity that has the interpretation of a, a a dose of X units from the test has an outcome that has the same as K units of the standard. So in other words, if K, for example, is 2, then we're saying that the potency of the test is twice that of the standard. And it turns here out here that K itself might be the quantity that we wish to estimate. And it turns out that there are a wide there are techniques for for not only the estimation of the relative potency but also the uh, option or the ability to provide confidence limits for that relative potency. The the exact method most often quoted uh, uses uses a result from something called Filer's theorem. That's not Feller. It's it's not Fisher. It's Filer. And and in, but but uh, Stata and other in other software often use other methods. One of them being the the uh, the technique uh, that is an approximate technique that's that's widely considered in some in some instances. So in addition to Filer's method, there is also the Delta method, which is widely implemented in software, including Stata. All right, so that's a, a, a very brief introduction to an, a situation in which one would not center, even though the variable is in principle measured, a measured explanatory variable. There's a whole range of literature here on this topic, and again, I would refer you to David Finney's very fine book. Next up, is a discussion of the circumstance that we have seen on many illustrations so far, and that is the notion of mutually exclusive and exhaustive indicators. And I thought that it would be of, of some value now to place these, uh, this particular discussion in, in one place insofar as um, it's, it's something that pops up over and over again in, in model construction, and I, I think that it is worth having a, um, a placement of it that makes the issues clear, I hope. When we use indicators that are mutually exclusive and exhaustive, we get far more than if the indicators that we're considering in, in a, uh, in a, uh, in your model for uh, investigation are not mutually exclusive and exhaustive. This is a big issue. So the issue of indicators when they are mutually exclusive and exhaustive is a very familiar one. Let's look at, a, at an example that I hope will clarify things for you. Okay. The very simplest circumstance is just where we have a simple uh, indicator for disease status, and all participants can be classified as either having the disease or not having a disease. So we can see that the responses are exhaustive. Further, that either D is zero or D is one, there's no other possibilities. So we can see that they are mutually exclusive. No one is both D equals zero and D equals one. All right, let's move to a slightly more complicated situation, say a case control study in which we're exploring an exposure to uh, two forms of, uh, of cancer treatment. And let's suppose the participants then uh, at the case stage are identified as individuals who have progression, no change, partial remission, or complete remission. Okay. So now we're wondering about the log of the odds of the exposure. This was the, the therapy, whether or not it was an alternating form or a sequential form. Okay. 
Now R, we can see, forms a mutually exclusive and exhaustive set. In other words, we have everyone being either classified as having their disease progressing, having no change, having partial remission, or complete remission. So everybody fits in one and only one of these groups. All right. So now we have a model in which we have an indicator for one of four conditions. What we've seen earlier in this session is that a baseline group would typically be selected. Perhaps the most, most obvious choice would be to choose baseline being that uh, the individual has had no change. Okay. So that would mean that we would have a model that looks like this. Again, it's important to note that the sum of these four uh, indicator variables is one. So one of them must become the, uh, the baseline group. And here it makes sense to consider then uh, perhaps choosing R equals 2 as that particular baseline group. So what we can see is that all of the regression coefficients are comparisons between the log of the odds of exposure for those with one of the three remaining characteristics minus the log of exposure for those with no change. So we could see, for example, that beta 1 is the difference between the log of odds of exposure for those with progression minus the log of odds of exposure for, for those with no change. And we can see a similar discussion for beta 3 and beta 4 perfectly sensible. Now, that's where we remove exactly one of the terms. Now, it is worth noting here that if, in fact, I were to remove another term, then everything changes. The interpretation of this model changes again. So removing one is required. Removing more than one requires careful consideration. In other words, if I was to, to exclude not only r equals 2, but also exclude r equals 1, then the baseline group has changed to those who are in either r equals either r1 equals 1 or r2 equals 1. So now the regression coefficients are interpreted as differences between the log of odds of exposure for those with partial remission minus the log of the odds of exposure for those with either progression or no change. So notice here that you need to be careful when you begin the model construction and start including and excluding terms. So just to remind you again, when we have mutually exclusive and exhaustive indicators, then we must have one group excluded from the model per se, the model description per se, the model presentation, I guess. And so that then we have a baseline group and regression coefficients become interpreted relative to that baseline group. And there's a wide range of contexts here. Okay, now I want to talk I guess that's a bit of a rant, as you'll see as we come into this, but the challenge of constructing models with non-mutually exclusive indicators. And what do we get? What is it we don't get? Maybe more to the point. Because when the indicators were mutually exclusive and exhaustive, we got regression coefficients that became interpreted relative to a baseline group. Perfectly sensible. However, that a requirement of the set being mutually exclusive and exhaustive is crucial to the interpretation of the regression coefficients. Let me uh, give you a, a simple example to clarify this. Let's suppose we have a case control study and we've got disease or case control status, and we've got the log of the odds of some exposure. Okay. 
Let's suppose we have, then, we have a model we might wish to consider that is uh, includes beta 1d plus beta 2a. Okay, two indicator variables. But notice here that that age group and disease or case control status are not mutually exclusive. Right? In fact, what we see here is that beta 1 is now an assumed common difference. Right, it's the difference between the log of odds of exposure for those with disease minus the log of odds of exposure for those with, without disease. By assume common here now we mean that that difference applies to both the young and the old. Notice this is a completely different description of that regression coefficient. If D and A were mutually exclusive, it's a completely different circumstance. In other words, with this model, we're assuming that it makes sense to discuss an assumed common difference. And then you'll recognize that, aha, Gordon, this is, in fact, the circumstance where we have apparently ruled out age as a modifier. Okay, so you, could, you would say to me, well, and you quite rightly so, that that model assumes that age does not modify. Should we assess that first? Almost always we, sh we should. Okay. So it's important to be aware of the fact that the inclusion of non-mutually exclusive indicators in a model requires careful interpretation. Let's take another more elaborate example that I think will help to uh, clarify what is a a, a tough issue. Let's suppose that investigators have the study of myocardial infarction. Oh dear, I've got to see, I see I have a typo there. In, it's not infraction, it's a myocardial infarction. And that the investigation is concerned about the relationship between the log of the odds of an MI and uh, a, a, way, a range of comorbidities. Okay, and in fact, um, there's a project for which I had uh, been been asked to uh, consult on, where they were considering thirty such comorbidities. So why this a study and designed to look at whether or not the log of the odds of myocardial infarction uh, involved uh, a, a quite large set of explanatory variables comorbidities. Well, let's just to give us something to get our head around, suppose that instead of having a list of 30 things, let's suppose it is just, say, hypertension, diabetes, yes, no, smoking status, yes, no, obesity, yes, no. So all of them indicators. Hypertension, diabetes, smoking, obesity, all indicators. Now, the first thing to notice is they are not mutually exclusive and exhaustive. Right. So what about a model that includes those four characteristics? Hypertension, diabetes, smoking, and obesity. And you might be thinking, oh, well, we'll just, as sometimes authors say, we'll just put those variables in the model. Uh-huh. If I do so, okay, looks looks pretty friendly here. Maybe this is going to help us to understand the relationship between the log of the odds of, MI, of an MI and these uh, these four explanatory variables. And in fact, if if you were to give Stata or any software such such a model, you would get a fit, and there'd be no um, almost almost um. Almost without exception, there'd be no no diagnostics given. Hmm. Such models, uh, you would think, would also have to include adjustment for for age and gender. So already we're getting kind of large, right? We're getting the models getting big. Hmm. But we'll leave age and gender out for the moment. 
Now, the issue here, one of the issues here, is that interpretation of such a model cannot involve a compare, an interpretation of the coefficients relative to a baseline group. It is commonly thought that such a, a set of regression coefficients, that any one of them could be interpreted as, say, a, uh, a difference between two, two log odds relative to the group that does not have comorbidities. But in fact, that's not the case here. We cannot interpret this model in that way. In fact, if you're looking at that, you're, you, you, you may be uh, on, on, uh, on the job here and noting, wait a minute, that's an additive model, right? I'm going to have to use the phrase assume common here. It isn't about a set of mutually exclusive and exhaustive indicators. We need a, con a very complicated set of, an, of interpretations here. Let's, for example, suppose one was interested in smoking status and the interpretation of beta 3 here. Hmm. So then we have a whole range of circumstances that is for which we have hypertension, yes, no, diabetes status, yes, no, obesity, yes, no. Hmm. Notice that Beta 3, this regression coefficient, is assumed common to all of those combinations. Okay? It means we can interpret Beta 3 as a log of an odds ratio. This is the log of the odds of an MI for those smokers relative to the log of the odds or minus the log of the odds for those who are non-smokers, but assume common in all of these cases. And it's worse than that because the assumption of, of additivity is, is present in each of those as well. It isn't just that it's assumed common. It's worse, okay? Because we're using additivity in discussing the impact of hypertension, diabetes status, and obesity. So keep in mind then that it is tempting to think that this regression coefficient beta 3 is merely the log of an odds ratio, smokers versus non-smokers, blurry, blurry, blurry words. It is not. It is a regression coefficient that, that is assumed common and subject to the additivity present in the others. And that assumed common issue applies to each of these regression coefficients, beta 1, beta 2, beta 3, and beta 4. Now, that is part of the challenge, right? Lots of combinations. Okay. And that was with just four of those 30 comorbidities. In fact, what was being presented as a candidate model involved all 30 of these comorbidities. <laughs> and this was the model that was fit. An additive model. Yeah. And some vague sort of statement about the fact that these regression coefficients beta refer to a particular odds ratio on the logarithmic scale, and they do not, without a huge number of interpret of assumptions. And here it is a massive collection of interpretations. Now, it may even be true that such even though a database is large, it, that you may not even have all these combinations. And the assumed common assumption is, is impossible. You, you simply can't assume it. You wouldn't be able to do it. Now, it is a, a possible option here with projects like this where you're attempting to determine which of the comorbidities are associated 
with myocardial infarction. Well, then what it might be sensible to do is determine which combinations of these explanatory variables are the most common. Maybe even use your software like Stata to detail the, the, the commonest groups that one might see. In other words, construct mutually exclusive and exhaustive sets where most of the sets are the uh, most common combinations of these comorbidities. Okay? And then maybe there's some catch-all uh, uh, sets uh, with, with remaining with remaining sets of individuals that are all grouped together. That's a weakness for sure in, in this approach, but nevertheless, what we're going to get from that approach is a set of mutually exclusive and exhaustive indicators for which we could, say, interpret the regression coefficients relative to a baseline that is, say, absence of all the comorbidities. Now, I mean, that type of investigation was actually entertained in, in this particular project, but it would be time-consuming and, and requiring a considerable amount of study. Whereas, as was pointed out by the person that was consulting with me, the person said, well, we can simply put all these variables in the model and then hope for the best. It's easy to do. The construction of mutually exclusive and exhaustive sets of comorbidities and the identification of ones with, with meaningful sizes requires a lot of study, a lot of investigation. So just, just to reprise, the construction of such a model with all of those regression coefficients has an illusion of simplicity. And one might think that there is a simple and realistic set of interpretations. But I hope I have convinced you that that interpretation of, of a model such as this one is hopeless and impossible. I, and the option to restrict attention to a small set of comorbidities, perhaps, also tricky for the same reason. Even if we restrict our attention to only those four, say hypertension, disease state, or diabetes status, smoking, and, and obesity, we still have trouble. Now, though the, the construction of these mutually exclusive and exhaustive sets has has some merit here and and indeed might be might be the kind of model that might have more value you may end up then getting an observation that certain sets of comorbidities have higher uh, uh, log odds ratios right and that might well be more important than a simplified and overly simplified set of, of interpretations of, say, things like hypertension is associated with, with MI or, or diabetes status is associated with MI. It may well be that what's more crucial is that the investigators identify the fact that hypertension and diabetes status are not mutually exclusive ex and exhaustive and then constructing sets of such might make vastly more sense. All right.